Oh yeah, can you feel it in your bones, folks? And hey, did you all know, like, kind of like the dwarves in Lord of the Rings that delved too greedily into the mountain? Yes, the dark elves delved too greedily into the sands of the land of Nehekara, and they managed to unleash the Tomb Kings upon Total War Warhammer 2, and I for one am glad they did. The Bone Boys are fantastic. And I was honestly probably most excited for the Tomb Kings as far as races that we thought would get added in Total War Warhammer 2. It had been speculated by the fan base for a long time that Tomb Kings would make it into Game 2. And eventually they did. They were the first race added in Game 2 and they came to us uh, late in 2017, I believe, um, or maybe early in 2018, depending on what the time difference was between the cinematic trailer and the actual release date. Um, but yeah, they were a fun addition. They are an undead faction, and much like the Vampire Counts, their units don't crumble. However, the Tomb Kings are different. They are the leftover civilization of folks that were once living, um, but now they basically also use necromancy to raise their skeletons and others from the dead. However, they also have these constructs like you see here in this awesome trailer that we were treated to. Constructs like the, the the gargoyles, the statues, the things that were part of their empire can be animated uh, and given life through magic. And honestly, those constructs are what make the Tomb Kings really unique, and it makes them uniquely powerful on the batter, battlefield. Um, as we'll see later on when we get into their roster, their roster is nothing special until you hit those constructs, and then all of a sudden their roster is just downright deadly. Uh, again, really nice addition to the game. The Tomb Kings were competitive in multiplayer. They were fun to play in campaign. They brought interesting new campaign gameplay mechanics um, with the uh, Mortuary Cult and Canopic Jars and the way that they don't pay upkeep or recruitment. Again, we'll cover all this in the video, but we definitely found ourselves with a unique faction coming into Warhammer 2. And today we are going to take a full look at whether or not the Tomb Kings are ready for Game 3. So here is the state of their faction. Okay, let's dive into the bony boys who never serve, but in fact, they rule. Um, here we are on the Mortal Empires campaign map selection. Let's take a look. There are four Tomb King legendary lords. We're going to have Setra the Imperishable, the Grand Hierophant Katep, I Queen Kalita, and Archon the Black. So four cool legendary lords that the Tomb Kings have a hold of, um, and each one definitely plays quite different from the next, so that's good. Let's see if they have very unique starts. Setra actually starts in the Land of the Dead, which is great, right in the Tomb King home turf. The Grand Hierophant Katep starts to the far west of the map, um, and north as well in Nagarond, so a bit of a Dark Elf heavy start for him. Um, and then we've got the High Queen Kalita, who starts um, in Mortal Empires over here by Devil's Backbone in the uh, Vortex campaign, which we'll see here in a moment. I believe she starts in Lustria. So a couple different starts for her. And Archon the Black here in Mortal Empires, starting in the Land of Assassins on the west coast of the Southlands. Um, so an interesting start for him. So we do get four unique starts for the Tomb Kings, and that is great. And the Tomb Kings play very different than other factions had prior to this point in terms of the way that you do army recruiting, and we'll cover that when we hit the campaign map. Out here, I really just really mostly wanted to cover who were the legendary lords and what are their start positions, are they unique? So for Mortal Empires, the answer is yes, and they're in good shape. And for the Vortex campaign, you can still play all four, and the answer is again, yes, and they should be in good shape. So Setra starts very near the same place. Hierophant Katep again, very near the same place. Alita does indeed start at the south end of Lustria, as I had thought. And then Archon starts in basically the same place. So not quite as varied as say like the Skaven between the Vortex and the Mortal Empires, but still very good, very unique start positions. Let's go ahead and go load in to some campaigns and see how unique their faction mechanics and gameplay are. Um, like I said, in past I'd kind of covered some of the Lord effects and stuff. I don't think these are a huge deal. They do play a little bit into the replayability of a faction, um, but probably not a huge deal, so I don't want to waste video time on them. In fact, let's go load up now. Welcome to the Land of the Dead. We've got Setra here in his Mortal Empire start. He does start here in Kimri. 
And there are quite a few things you need to know about the Tomb King's campaign. First, let's start with the Books of Nagash. It says, scattered far and wide throughout the world are the Books of Nagash. Once collected, it will grant you powers and unique rewards. So, the Books of Nagash, you kind of get an idea of where they are on the map. Um, so, like, for instance, Karak Eight Peaks, you have to occupy it. Uh, Lamia, um, let's see where this one's at. So, this one is... I think it's focused on a lord, yeah. Bloodgrather Dwellers, Zardox, you have to defeat that lord's army. Uh, Skaven Blight. Um, let's see, books. Anyway, you get the idea. So basically, you're chasing down these books in the gash. They uh, unlock certain things for you. You can see the reward for each book. So that's pretty cool. And then they also added some canopic jars as a special currency. And you can see that you could get these potentially from characters, harvesting organs from captives after a battle, buildings, missions, great incantations, events. Um, and then you can use them in this mortuary cult that CA added, which is similar to what they gave the dwarves with their oath gold. And honestly, it's pretty cool. Um, so you can basically concoct the regiments of renown, um, which this is a neat way to unlock some uh, some cool regiments. And then you can also get uh, weapons, armor, enchanted items, talismans, and arcane items by using the canopic jars and these special trade items that are around the map. So this was really pretty neat, honestly. It's a pretty cool way to play, but beyond that, I think it's fair, like, th those are their special kind of, like, currency and, like, missions that you chase. However, there's more to the Tomb Kings um, that make things a little different to them. So it says Day of Awakening. Tomb King factions can recruit units into their armies without the need to pay for the recruitment or their upkeep. Instead, each unit has a limited initial recruitment capacity, which can be increased by constructing additional buildings. So the Tomb Kings can recruit as much as they want, um, as long as they haven't hit the unit cap. And you can see, like, starting off, that you're not going to get capped on skeleton warriors or spearmen. But, for instance, starting from there on up, you will. And you have to go in and build buildings. So let's go take a look at this. You can see uh, each of these buildings can up the capacity of certain units, and it tells you so uh, when you build them. So a different way to play um, makes it where you don't have to fuss and fight with upkeep, uh, which is quite nice, uh, especially for newer players sometimes. Um, it makes for an interesting style of gameplay, um, and so if you defeat Tomb King army, you better darn well go take advantage of it quickly, because if you give them a few turns to keep recruiting, it's not like they're paying for it. So it makes fighting them kind of interesting as well, because they definitely feel like this undead horde, rather than a faction tied to some kind of mortal economy, right? So overall, I think these are really cool. Um, you've also got dynasties here, rather than research. And it is basically research, but it's all about these different dynasties, and you can unlock cool stuff. Um, you can see this gives you extra army capacity as you unlock these different dynasties, and you can pick up these special lords and stuff um, by using the canopic jars to look into that research. So it was a pretty cool tech tree for them as well. So overall, pretty solid job here from CA in putting together a unique campaign feel and experience for the Tomb Kings, especially since they were a DLC faction, right? They weren't part of the base game. This is the first time they're asking you to pay for a race. I think it's pretty good. Let's go take a look at the other lords and see if they stack up or have anything different or unique. So I loaded up Katep. Let's see if anything looks different for Katep. He's still got the Canopic Jars. He's still looking for the books in Nagash. Nothing different here. Dynasties, Mortuary Cult. So Nagash is going to follow the exact same formula. So nothing unique in terms of campaign mechanics between Nagash and Setra. Obviously, they do have different faction and lord effects. And again, those are back on the campaign load-in screen. You can look more closely at those if you'd like to on your own. Let's go take a look at Kalita. Hi, Queen Kalita and the court of Libaris. Let's see if they have anything unique. They do not. They're going to play just like the other Tomb Kings factions. So uh, other than making your units better at archery and being a pretty decent melee combatant with an interesting mount on top of a sepulchral... I don't know, like lizard or snake or something. I don't know what they call it. Um, but in any case, uh, that's Kalita. So she doesn't have any, again, unique campaign mechanics amongst the other Tomb Kings. All right, and then we have Archon the Black. And uh, again, he's going to have the same mechanics that the other Tomb Kings do. I feel like it's worth mentioning, though, that despite the fact that all the Tomb Kings have the exact same um, campaign mechanics, there's nothing different 
um, per se between like canopic jars and books in the gash. Um, some things you might notice as far as small differences are going to come in those Lord and faction buffs. Like I said, Kalita kind of offers uh, missile buffs and um, then Katep is an artillery platform if you level him up enough. Cetra is a huge melee beast when you level him up right. Archon is all about death magic, but he can also, he has a special ability to pull in vampire units. Um, and that's something that uh, other um, Tomb Kings factions are not able to do. Yeah, he can recruit crypt ghouls and some bats and some other uh, vampire units um, that other factions can't. Whereas, you know, like for instance, Kalita absolutely hates vampires. Um, Archon's kind of embraced a little bit of their necromancy and stuff. So it, it's kind of interesting. Again, minor differences between these factions, but still differences that stack up and may give you a reason uh, to want to play them each separately. So I think it's worth noting. Overall, I mean, it would be nice to see CA go through every Lord uh, by the time we get to the end of Total War Warhammer 3 and each one of them have some type of unique thing to them and campaign in terms of like an interface or something here. Don't get me wrong. It's not like they've dropped the ball or something. Each of these lords has special effects for themselves, for their faction, and slightly unique things about them. They do share the exact same campaign faction mechanics up here. Get it understood. I think it'd be neat to see them all get diversified. Do they have to? No, probably not. Um, but I think it would be ideal as the consumer and player of the game to see that. So anyway, in terms of their faction start, or their, sorry, their campaign starts and mechanics, so Tomb Kings are in good shape. They're not in some kind of horrible shape. I think they're ready for game three, and they're in pretty good shape in that regard. Let's go and take a look at their roster and see how they stack up there. So here is the Tomb Kings roster. We're going to start out in infantry as we usually do. Honestly, the Tomb Kings roster, just in terms of raw numbers, it's pretty thin. Now, that said, let's go through it, though, and take a look. Thin in numbers doesn't always necessarily mean that they need a whole bunch more. Let's run through these units. They've got Skeleton Warriors and Skeleton Spearmen. Basically the same unit except one comes with a spear, the other comes with a sword. One is obviously anti-large and the other is not. Now remember that Tomb King units have a couple of unique features. They're undead, so they don't rout. They crumble, similar to vampires. And they also have this Realm of Souls, where the unit gets healing as the Realm of Souls fills up with souls. So as you go and start killing enemies, you start to fill up this Realm of Souls. And um, as you hit these different tiers... Um, the unit will get some hit points, which makes their units last a little longer in a fight. Next tier up is Nehekara Warriors. These are going to be good damage dealers for low armor foes. Uh, and remember that undead infantry tends to have worse stats because they don't rout, and they last a little longer in a fight. So you'll see the stats on most of these units doesn't look particularly impressive. It's because they're not. You know, they're, they're undead units, and that's just kind of standard for how they play. Um, once you get past Nehekara Warriors, we get to Tomb Guard, which are a nice mid-tier infantry. They've got 50 armor and a good shield, which means they're not a low armor unit, and they have pretty solid melee defense, which means they're not going to be particularly easy for an enemy to cut through. Um, so they, they provide the Tomb King some nice mid-tier infantry at a reasonable price. And then you get Tomb Guard with Halberds. These ones provide an AP anti-large element, and for an undead faction to have a decently armored um, AP anti-large unit that doesn't rout is pretty strong. And Tomb Guard with Halberds can be a really nice unit, and they really make a big distinction between the Tomb Kings and the Vampires, whereas the Vampires cannot hold with any type of thing like a Halberd. They just don't have it. Tomb Kings can, and it gives them the ability to protect a lot of their missile units much better than a faction like them would otherwise be able to do. So pretty thin. Only five units of infantry. But their infantry really only needs to be a meat shield because they have strengths elsewhere. So, I'll talk more about this, but I, I don't really think this is a big hit against them. Archers. They only have one option. Skeleton archers. Cheap and plentiful. That's pretty much a summary of skeleton archers. 140 range, no armor, um, but cheap. Don't write these guys off. Remember that Kalita buffs these things, um, like I mentioned earlier, whenever they get into battle. Skeleton archers may seem like an easy write-off, but they don't rout. They don't get scared away. Um, like, you know, cheap peasant bowmen. They just keep shooting, and if you put someone like Kalita around them, or buff them with any other kind of buffs or magic, they can do a ton of damage, and they can be really annoying, because again, they're not going to run away when you have a unit start getting into them and doing damage. They 
they have to be completely crumbled um, and taken out that way. So skeleton archers may not look good on paper, but they're not bad, and I wouldn't underestimate them. However, the Tomb Kings have a lot more missile options, and we'll get to those. From a cavalry standpoint, again, one would look at the Tomb Kings and be like, man, their cavalry's trash. And again, on paper, it's not great. They've got skeleton horsemen here, which are really cheap and really only effective at harassing enemy skirmers and uh, skirmishers and cheap infantry. Um, essentially, when you need speed, that's an option. And then they have the Nehekara horsemen, which do considerably more damage to low armor infantry or skirmishers. They're going to do the job faster than ske uh, skeleton horsemen, do a little more damage in general. Then you get skeleton chariots, which they're not armor piercing, but they have decent armor at 80, and they're relatively quick, and they're going to be a good option against enemy infantry. A little bit squishy, like most units in the Undead roster, but still provides an option for the Tomb Kings to do specific anti-infantry damage. Then, to help supplement the Skeleton Archers, we also have Skeleton Horse Archers, which have slightly more damage at a reduced number, and they still fire at the same range. They're mounted on horseback rather quick. This gives the Tomb Kings a quick-moving ranged option. And then they have Skeleton Archer Chariots, which provide basically the same chariot damage, but they have the benefit of having archers on them as well. So again, looking pretty thin in the cavalry and chariots between standard and missile, not a lot of options. So infantry, missile infantry, cavalry and chariots, missile, cavalry and chariots, all very thin. And then we get monsters and beasts, and again, very thin. <laughs> you just have carrion, which are these flying war beasts. Um, they can vanguard deploy. They're actually quite good at disrupting enemy artillery and skirmishers. So they do have a very good use. They're very weak, but they're fast and they can basically get in and clog up an enemy plan. So again, very thin. However, here we come to a new section called Constructs, and no one else has this. And essentially, though, it is like Monsters and Beasts, okay? Except the Tomb Kings don't have anything living, right? So these are Constructs that are, you know, maybe big gargoyles or statues around their tombs that they've brought to life, uh, animated these Constructs, if you will, with their, their magic. And this is where the Tomb King roster starts to pick up some very serious power. You got Ushabti, which are a fast-moving AP anti-infantry weapon with pretty good armor, so they're a monstrous infantry, and they're a pretty darn good one at a cost of only 900. You have a Tomb Scorpion at a cost of 1,000, which again, an excellent AP anti-infantry, except this one's single entity, and it also causes terror. Scorpion is a fantastic assistant to a cheap infantry line. We're just adding more power to a Tomb King infantry line because Tomb King infantry is not that good. So the Tomb King's infantry needs to be supported with these constructs like the Scorpion, like the Ushabti. Um, and speaking of Ushabti, they also have a Great Bow variant, which has a pretty decent range at 255. They still do pretty good weapon strength, but their missile strength is excellent at 124. And these guys will annihilate large and valuable targets in no time, especially in groups. Ushabti with Great Bow are some of the most deadly units in the game, in my opinion, on our really important to the Tomb King roster at providing a real way to do damage because your infantry ain't going to do it. It's going to be done by something like the Ashabti with Great Bow. Then we got Sepulchral Stalkers, which are an interesting monstrous infantry. Um, they have a short-range missile attack, which is very powerful and armor-piercing. And then they have decent armor-piercing anti-large weapon strength. So they kind of operate as like a short-range missile unit. If you can get lucky enough to park them near something valuable, and keep them out of that combat. They can do some good damage, and then they can jump in the fight, and they do pretty decent in that fight afterwards. Their melee attack's a little low, so it's hard for them to land hits. Um, however, they do, um, do do some nice damage when they do hit. Then you got Necropolis Knights, which you didn't have good cavalry, but this is essentially a cavalry unit um, for the Tomb Kings, and it is a good cavalry unit. Necropolis Knights do armor-piercing damage with poison attacks. They have very high armor, and they have a very solid charge bonus. So this is not a unit to, to, to write off. If they get into your armored infantry or other armored units and you don't have any anti-large capability, they're going to cause tremendous damage. Not a unit that you want to be there. Um, then we're going to have Necropolis Knights with Halberds, which are a variant of the Necropolis Knights, which are specifically also good against large. And they maintain that poison attack. These are tough units. They can get in there and cause damage with some of the biggest, baddest cavalry in the game. They're not quite as good as those cavalry, but they're good. And remember, they can be supported with summons or cheap skeletons and other stuff like that, and they can be quite deadly. So again, Necropolis Knights with Halberds provide another cavalry option, essentially. Then we have the Bone Giant, 
um, otherwise known as a sniper giant, aka Bone Daddy. Like, there's a whole bunch of different names um, for the Bone Giant. Bone Giants are awesome units. Their armor is pretty solid. They do really good weapon strength and melee, but they have 20 ammunition, a whopping 350 range, and it does massive AP anti-large damage. It is a single arrow when it shoots. So you need to have a big target or a nice group of targets like a cavalry unit that you're firing at, and it'll do tremendous damage to those large armored targets. Um, and the Tomb King is, or sorry, the Bone Giants, especially in numbers, like in the campaign, if you stack up three or four of these guys, they can be absolutely brutal in deleting key enemy units. So very powerful units, very nice, interesting artillery slash monster unit in the game for the Tomb Kings. Then we get the Kimrian War Sphinx. This is a nice melee monster, um, single entity. It's really good against armor and infantry. It's going to do tremendous damage when it gets into armored infantry, or just infantry in general. It does have some short range missiles and a lot of them, so it can do a little damage and kiting and working around that infantry. Very nice monster. Again, very good if you're looking specifically to crush infantry. Then we have the Hyro Titan, a really cool unit. It doesn't get used a ton because it's a little bit slow. It's a lot like a giant in a way, but it's better armored. And of course, it doesn't have leadership issues because it doesn't really rely on, you know, routing and stuff. It can crumble, of course, because it's a construct. Um, but the Hyro Titan has some really cool laser eye effects like we saw in the, um, the trailer. Very neat looking unit. It has some bound spells too of Spirit Leech and Shim's Burning Gaze. So it's like a magic um, construct. It has really good attack, not bad defense, and it does huge armor piercing weapon damage. So this thing's good against melee blobs, basically. Get into those melee blobs, make sure and pop off the Spirit Leech and the Shim's Burning Gauge for a little bit of extra damage. And it's a fun unit to use. I don't see this one a ton in multiplayer, but it is kind of fun to use in campaign. And finally, we've got the Necro Sphinx, which provides the AP anti-large punch and makes the Tomb Kings very dangerous for anybody who's trying to bring in single entity monsters or large cavalry units to go after the Tomb King's missiles. The Necro Sphinx will make you pay a very dear price in melee. If you are a large unit, it is a powerful anti-large tool, and it is very good at what it does. And so again, everything prior to this is screaming, hey, the Tomb King's roster sucks. And it is because it is subpar in all of these other ways, but it is fantastic thanks to the constructs. And the way that these constructs support those other units is really good and they meld in with them and they work together and it makes the tomb kings a very competitive faction overall and very strong in both campaign and multiplayer if used right one last section here though artillery and war machines the screaming skull catapult is kind of a meme um it's not terrible but it's really not great it's fairly limited range for a catapult actually at only 380 um it does do some magic damage and it has this take cover thing which hurts leadership armor piercing. I don't really like it though. The Casket of Souls has better range and causes significantly more damage. And the Casket of Souls are extremely deadly against skirmishers like archers, um, against infantry, and sometimes even against cavalry units. This thing causes big AP damage. It's kind of got homing shots too, so it's real easy for it to hit. And if there's multiple of these in multiplayer and you don't have a good answer to it, prepare to get wrecked. They are going to do tremendous damage. The Casket of Souls, in my opinion, is one of the strongest artillery units in the games for that scenario of killing infantry and skirmishers from long range. Very, very good units. Again, do not underestimate them. They're also a single entity, and you can't just destroy a cannon or something like you can with some units. You have to kill the whole entity. Um, they're a lot of slow and vulnerable, um, but they're very powerful. So that's the roster, and we'll talk heroes and lords here in a minute. But just from a roster standpoint, again, the Tomb Kings look thin on the numbers, but they make up for it with the constructs. The Tomb King constructs are excellent. And they, in my opinion, they make the faction, and they make the faction good. They're a lot of fun to play in both multiplayer and in campaign, and I've had success with them in both. I think you would too. Now let's cover the heroes and the lords here. From a hero standpoint, you got a Necrotech, so let's say you're bringing a lot of constructs to battle and you want to support those constructs. Well, the Necrotech is going to be your go-to. Got a Chariot Mount in case you want him to be good against infantry. Um, he's good against infantry on foot as well. Has an anti-infantry bonus either way. He's just faster with the Chariot. But there's a special ability and it's right here that restores a thousand hit points on a construct that can be used twice. So basically you can add 2000 hit points to your constructs if you keep this guy alive and use him properly. 
Um, you can see here that he can add some missile resistance and base armor to anything within a 30 meter radius that's a construct. Um, and again, if a unit is a construct and um, it affects in fact 30, meters, 30 meter radius, extra melee attack and extra armor piercing weapon damage. So these things are all focused um, on helping constructs. A cool uh, add to the Tomb King roster, uh, roster and a nice way to keep those monsters rolling. Now we got the Tomb Prince. The Tomb Prince is a really cool um, feature in the Tomb King roster because he's AP anti-large, and it's the same when you stick him on the Skeletal Steed. So let's say that you need to protect your Lord from, you know, diving monsters or single entities, and you're not going to go full in for, let's say, a Necrosphinx or something like that. The Tomb Prince is a really cost-effective way to get some AP anti-large, plus he has the Guardian ability which puts some physical resistance on any other nearby lord or heroes. Got the Curse of Dishoff here, which is really nice. Debuff, and you can see that he can actually use Tomb Strike as well and buff his own attack, making him really quite deadly. So I think the Tomb Prince is a great hero for the Tomb Kings and very, very good in multiple scenarios. Now, the Tomb Kings have access to a few lords of magic. Death, Light, and Nehekara. And they're going to have a Lich Priest for each of these. Lich Priests are like most casters, they're not good in melee, and they're relatively low armor, but they bring magic to the battlefield, and their magic can be powerful. I'm not going to cover the lore of death or these others, well, we'll cover Nehekara a little because no one else had it. Um, but yeah, they can be mounted on a skeletal steed for more speed, or they can be on foot. So you got death, you've got light, and then finally you got the Nehekara lore, and the spells in Nehekara, let's... Oop, I don't know why I did that, I clicked the wrong button. Let's check these spells in the Nehekara lore. You get Dejaf's Incantation, which can make someone stronger while on melee. Um, you've got Nehru's Incantation, which is a really good one for protecting your own lord or some allied unit. The Overcast to get extra time out of it. Um, so it gives a lot of physical resistance. And then you've got Assyrian's Incantation of Vengeance, which is a nice direct damage spell. Um, it's meant to be used against um, larger entity units. Um, it's not meant to be used against single entities. Uh, and then you got Tra's Incantation of Righteous Smiting, which makes a unit have much better missile damage and armor-piercing missile damage. This is a great buff to put on something like a new Shabti with Great Bow, and it doesn't take a whole lot of magic, and you can make your casket or your Shabti do a ton more damage uh, for a short period of time. Um, so very, very cool stuff. And we've got Sakmet's Incantation of Skullstorm, which is a vortex, kind of a, a cool uh, Skullstorm vortex that if you drop it on a blob, it's pretty good. It's obviously not good against single combatants. And then finally, we got Uskep's Incantation of Desiccation, which is a very nice debuff against melee attack and melee defense. Pretty expensive, but it is a very nice debuff and lasts for almost 40 seconds. So the lore of Nehekara is pretty solid. Like, it's it's not bad. Like, it's definitely got some useful spells in it. Now let's take a look at lords. There is only one option for generic lord, and it is the Tomb King. You can be mounted on a Skeletal Steed, a Skeleton Chariot, or a Kimrian War Sphinx. The latter two mounts are meant to be anti-infantry specific, with the Kimrian War Sphinx being the better of the two options in terms of sheer damage, whereas the Chariot being a little bit faster and a bit smaller target. Skeletal Steed, it is just, uh, there's no special bonuses to AP, anti-large, anything else like that. It just makes your Tomb King relatively fast. And on foot, the damage stays much the same, but of course they're much slower. You have a good shield though. So not a lot of options, again, with the Tomb Kings, but not a bad option either. Um, and then we get into the Legendary Lords. So High Queen Kalita has the Skeleton Chariot and the Necro Serpent. That was the word I was looking for earlier that I couldn't think of. And on her Necro Serpent, Kalita does some pretty decent damage. She is kind of a big target, though, and a little bit vulnerable. It's not anti-large, but she does have poison. She has a solid charge bonus and pretty good stats for attack and defense. Um, so she'll be okay, but just be careful. Like, don't get her in there against Kolek or something else that's going to be doing a lot of uh, anti-large or AP damage. But really, her main use is in these abilities, uh, like this one right here, the Blessing of Asaf. It's a big buff to nearby missile units, and you park her near some uh, Ushabti with Great Bow or a line of Skeleton Archers, it's going to get real. Like, they're going to start hurting you real bad, real fast. Um, she's got a lot of other nice buffs here that basically make her a good support unit um, for everything around her. And she's also got the Venom Staff, which is a magic missile that she can use from range. So Kalita is a fun one if you're looking to buff up your missile capability. 
Atep is an interesting pick because from a spell standpoint, he gets the law, uh, sorry, the lore of Nehekara. So he's cool in that regard, but he can also be mounted, and this is a very unique one, on a casket of souls, making him an artillery piece on the battlefield. So having your Lord play the role of artillery piece and caster is fairly unique. Um, it's not common. So this is something pretty unique to Katap. He can also get on a skeletal steed and on a skeleton chariot, and he performs in melee similar to a Lich Priest, except that he does have a little bit better armor, I think, than a Lich Priest. Um, so yeah, those are your options with him. And then uh, as far as abilities go, he's got some, uh, he's got a curse here. It's a direct damage against a uh, multiple combatant type enemy. He can do some healing here with the Restless Dead. Um, when he's casting, it'll do some extra healing. Um, he can grant some extra attack and defense to stuff near him. He's got the Arcane Conduit, which is handy for any caster wanting to get more spells in. And he's got a Sandstorm Vortex that's bound to him that's good against armor. So he can do a little bit of blob busting, and he can certainly do blob busting when he's on the Casket of Souls. Um, and then his special thing over here is the Lich Staff, which is an ability recharge addition to anything that gets near him when he's casting. That can be pretty handy for him to basically stop people from using special abilities if he starts casting at them whenever they are near. Um, so Katep is certainly a unique and interesting pick. Then we got Archon the Black, who is a pretty popular pick amongst the Tomb Kings because the Lore of Death is pretty handy. Um, it can be used to wear down single entities. It's got a good blob-busting spell with the Purple Sun. It can break leadership. It can debuff. So Lore of Death is quite nice. Archon's got a few notable abilities, though. He got the Liber Mortis here, which gives him huge physical resistance and leadership. And this isn't just him. It's all the allies that are within range, like a 40-meter radius. So that is quite powerful. Um, it's a very nice buff that can be used over a short period. He's got this Curse ability as well, like we saw before. And then in terms of items, he's got the Staff of Nagash, which gives him better power recharge rates. And then he's also got the Tomb Blades of Archon, which summons a unit of skeletons you can use to basically help block for him. Uh, he's really not bad in melee. He's not amazing, um, but he's not bad for a caster, especially when you put him on the chariot, he's an anti-infantry tool. So uh, Archon is a pretty um, diversified pick in the sense that he's good at quite a few things, but probably not the best at everything. Um, and then we got Setra. Setra is a pretty tough character. You can see he's AP anti-large when he's just on foot. He maintains that on a skeletal steed. On the Kimrian War Sphinx, he becomes an anti-infantry tool, and then he has a special mount called the Chariot of the Gods, and it makes him an even better anti-infantry tool in terms of being very fast, and he has very high mass, and he's difficult to stop. So he's an anti-infantry nightmare on the Chariot of the Gods, I might add. And then he also has the lore of Nehekara. Amongst them that are very useful is the incantation, or Nehru's incantation of protection, because it makes him very difficult to kill for short periods of time. Um, he does have this Blessed Blade of Tra, which is a nice debuff um, to the stuff that he hits. And um, then this Crown of Nehekara, which is buffing nearby allies. Um, and as far as abilities go over here, he's got a Wrath of Tra um, explosion ability that allows him to escape a blob, essentially. Um, and then he also has the Restless um, Dead, which is similar um, to uh, Katep, and then the Curse as well, which we saw in some of the other lords. So... Overall, differing lore choices, not that many, but what you get is good. So I think that's kind of like a reoccurring theme for the Tomb Kings. Not that much, but what you get is definitely capable. I like the Tomb Kings roster. I think it's in good shape. There may be more things from the Tomb King that were on tabletop that we don't have in the game. And if that's the case, I'd love to see some of that stuff come to the Tomb Kings in Game 3, just because, hey, why not? I want all the content we could get in Game 3. Um, so it would be neat to see the Tomb Kings get some more Lords, but let's be honest, their roster is solid in both multiplayer and in campaign. And then we took a look earlier at their campaign starts and mechanics. It's all pretty solid. I don't think they're like the top tier best ever in terms of condition for Game 3. They're definitely in solid shape for Game 3. The Tomb Kings are ready. Hopefully we'll see some more content for them when we get into Game 3 as well. Um, but they're not going to die without it, right? They're in pretty good shape. Anyway, that's my wrap up for the Tomb Kings. You all tell me what you think. Did I get the Bone Boys right or did I get them wrong? I'd love to hear from you down in the comments and I will be back soon with, as you may have guessed it, the Vampire Coast. So get your pirate shanties ready, be ready to sing, and we'll cover that faction soon. Air of Carthage, signing out for now.